Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Futurum Tech Webcast. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Olivier Blanchard. And we are going to talk today about lots of exciting things, uh, focusing a little bit on devices and a little bit on the automotive industry and a little bit on chips and what we think might be ahead. Olivier, welcome. Well, it's good to be here. Absolutely. And it's great that it's Friday. Although this week does seem to me like it's been, I don't know, a week of um, 4,000 Mondays. But anyway, here we go. Yep. Welcome so, to January. Exactly. Exactly. And the only thing worse is going to be February. I know. And it's almost March already, by the way, again. <laughs> so, again that's fun. so we are going to jump right in and we're going to talk a little bit about um, Honor which is a smartphone company. And uh, this company has moved on from Huawei in the last, oh, I don't know, six months. Maybe that sale was happened in about November of 2020. And um, when uh, Honor became independent from Huawei and this move for those of you who might not be aware was, I, I believe, to separate itself from Huawei who has been in trouble with the U.S. over sanctions um, uh, imposed by the United States government. And, um, the news was that um, Honor was confirming that it had secured partnership agreements with key global ship global chip makers, among them AMD, Intel, Nvidia, Microsoft, Samsung, SK Hynix, Sony, and Qualcomm. And Olivier wrote a really interesting piece on that. And what was most interesting to him, I think, what was maybe the tidbits of information that we didn't see other analysts covering. So with that, Olivier. Talk to us a little bit about this. Yeah, so some of the stuff that was interesting is, first of all, yeah, it's it was a, a really smart move for Honor to disengage itself from uh, from Huawei, given uh, a lot of the limitations imposed on Huawei by several governments, and particularly the uh, the U.S. government. So now that it's on its own, it has it's it's no longer under the same uh, restrictions that that Huawei still is, and it's more free to do what it's going to do. And the thing about Honor is that it was essentially a um, kind of like a, a low price or budget focused brands uh, that belong to the Huawei umbrella. And so it's it has several opportunities now. First, because it's no longer limited by uh, Huawei ownership, it has managed to secure very quickly since December uh, a group partnership agreements with basically all the major chip makers that it needed to uh, to make agreements with. Uh, so it can really kind of go into full production, do whatever it wants. But uh, there was a time of limbo between the time that uh, it, it was it announced or it started contemplating separating itself from Huawei and now. And so during that time, uh, it still managed to innovate and come out with uh, with new devices. Uh, mainly what we saw in the last couple of weeks uh, were a brand new phone called the uh, V45G, uh, which retails somewhere between 500 and 700 bucks. Um, and what was one of the things that was interesting is it, it came out powered with uh, a MediaTek platform, the Dimensity 1000 Plus, which is a 5G platform. Right. Uh, and not the 1200, which is the more recent one. And that to me uh, and to other analysts I noticed indicated that uh, there's a good chance that Honor was kind of dipping into a stockpile of chips that Huawei may have kind of hogged before or mm -hmm. in anticipation of, uh, of sanctions against it. So, uh, so essentially what was happening with Honor is they were doing what they could with the access to chips that they had kind of like in their warehouse. And in order to compensate uh, for the fact that this was a, a older chipset, they put a crazy good uh, screen on this uh, that you normally wouldn't find on a, on a phone at that price range. Usually you would find it on a phone of, of like 800 to 1200 dollars um it's really really nice 120 uh, hertz uh oled display so that that pointed to kind of a, a or hinted to something else and and basically what honor wants to be as a company now that it's no longer uh under the uh the thumb if you will of huawei and because when it was working under huawei it was a budget brand and now it no longer works with huawei Honor has the opportunity to expand and become a smartphone maker like everybody else and compete at every price tier, not right. just the low and medium, but also high premium. 
And uh, so in thinking about this, and it's, it's, um, it's competition there realistically in the first couple of years would be companies like Xiaomi and Oppo, which are not particularly well known in the West, but they have really good reputations. They, they use really good, um, really good materials and really good components, and they produce really good phones at various price ranges that are popular with younger, um, with younger consumers. So in that light, you have Honor that's trying to come out as its own brand, that's finally free to do what it wants, that has to prove itself to the market in the, in the next year. And we are in essentially year two and a half of 5G deployments. So 5G is a huge factor in uh, the success of uh, a handset maker like Honor. And so I was thinking about all these different suppliers, all these agreements that it has for a variety of, um, of components, needs, use cases, and also devices. Uh, Honor also comes out with laptops that are fairly decent. So that's where you're gonna see some of the AMD action happening. Um, but specifically with the handsets, what I noticed is that it used to depend on MediaTek. And uh, MediaTek has, uh, excellent modems, it has excellent 5G platforms, but the one thing that MediaTek currently doesn't have with its 5G modems and its 5G mobile platform is a millimeter wave compatible solution. And for those of us who need a refresher, 5G is essentially two things. 5G, you have the, the sub six gigahertz bands, which are much more similar to 4G LTE bands, just a little bit faster, a little bit higher. And then you also have millimeter wave, which is a completely different technology uh, that, that has a, a very limited range, but is capable of pushing huge, huge amounts of data very fast across a network. And MediaTek modems and platforms currently do not support millimeter wave. The, the platforms that do and the modems that do really well are Qualcomm chipsets. And so uh, in the last year, Qualcomm has expanded its millimeter wave uh, capabilities to its modem and uh, the various modems and various mobile platform, the complete chipsets, the SOCs that phones are built on, down from its premium tier to its high and medium tiers and then even lower tiers. And it just released a, uh, a mobile platform called the four, Snapdragon 480 5G that even though it's a budget uh, focused chipset uh, is millimeter wave capable as opposed to MediaTek, which isn't. And so what I'm thinking and what, what I didn't really read a lot in the tech press in the last uh, week or two weeks was this notion that um, Honor in its efforts to compete against Xiaomi, position itself against Xiaomi and Oppo and, and other handset makers, um, probably doesn't have much of a choice here. If it stays with MediaTek, it will not have enough or it won't have a full range of millimeter wave capable smartphones. However, if it wants to compete with the big boys, it needs to have it, which means they have to get at least their modems, if not their entire SOCs, the entire mobile platforms from Qualcomm. And this is kind of a, a really good socket potentially for Qualcomm uh, because Honor plans on shipping somewhere between 60 million to on the low end to 100 million on the very high end phones um, just in this year. So, um, so we could see Qualcomm's decision to incorporate millimeter wave capability up and down all of its uh, SOC tiers uh, pay off just with this one customer, uh, Honor, uh, basically entering the market the way it is. So it's, uh, it's just kind of like a value add and just a little, little bit of, uh, of a tech intelligence that um, I think wasn't really focused on nearly as much as it should have been. Yeah, I thought it was really cool and really interesting to see, you know, Qualcomm embracing the sort of something for everyone at every level. And this this connection, I think, that you've made makes perfect sense. So speaking of Qualcomm, um, I know that uh, Qualcomm kicked off its Automotive Showcase 2021. And I, I always pay a lot of attention to the automotive industry. And I know you covered this for us. Um, this week as well, and there was just a slew of announcements out of Qualcomm following this event, and we're and you know we're sort of seeing um, the company's automotive sector strategy shifting, um, shifting into high gear, we think. And so maybe touch base a little bit on some of those key announcements that came out of the event this week. 
yeah, we could dedicate an entire uh, entire <laughs> episode of this to to these announcements. So they, yeah, uh, so Qualcomm came in heavy and hard with announcements this week. So they had a an event called the Automotive Showcase 2021, which is interesting because two years ago uh, or a year and a half ago, um, I, I was in uh, in New York for an analyst event in which uh, Qualcomm was kind of talking about its strategy from now until 2025, essentially. But it was really focused on on 2019 to 2023. Uh, and I noticed that there were a lot more slides about the automotive industry than about even 5G or, or, or anything else. So it was kind of obvious at the time that Qualcomm was starting to focus a lot of its attention on automotive and obviously understanding that it's a, uh, that it's a huge deal uh, and a huge opportunity for, uh, for a chip maker. And uh, one thing that people don't realize is that a lot of chips go into vehicles now. Uh, the average car being made today has an average of uh, anywhere from 50 to 150 chips in them. So just on volume alone, uh, any, any chip maker in the world that isn't really kind of focusing on automotive, whether it's conductivity, whether it's uh, infotainment, cockpit, ADAS, or any kind of like a driver assistance uh, systems, is kind of leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's perfectly normal, I think, and expected to see that, um, that Qualcomm is doubling its attention on automotive. And this is nothing new. So a lot of people don't realize that Qualcomm has been working in the automotive space for a while, but they have been from the very beginning for a lot of reasons. And have had some really big partnerships. And one of the ones I think that was kind of uh, uh, emphasized a little bit this week was uh, kind of an expansion of Qualcomm's relationship with GM, General Motors. Um, and so what, what GM were already doing in the background, they were working on connectivity applications and CV2X, um, but now they're expanding into digital cockpits, uh, next generation telematic systems, and ADAS, which is, stands for Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. Um, so essentially what's happening here is kind of a, a up until now, their partnership was a little bit of a trial run, kind of like, okay, let's see what we can what we can build together. And now, after this proof of concept, now that Qualcomm is developing much more precise and uh, and more powerful platforms, especially driven by AI uh, and and other um, kind of adjacent technologies that Qualcomm's really good at, um, they've kind of adapted their Snapdragon platform and just moved it over and completely uh, specialized it for automotive. And we're seeing companies like GM uh, essentially buy into this and go, okay, it's essentially build out the, the mobile platform, the mob, mobile tech, uh, uh, connectivity platform, the mobile ADAS platform, just bring it all together. And uh, so Qualcomm managed to, uh, to secure that partnership. And it also has uh, partnerships at various levels of all these different technologies that go into vehicles with uh, 20, I think, of the world's uh, top 25 automakers. So already. So that's really good. Um, there's also, there were a bunch of other announcements. Uh, like for instance, I think it was Alexa. Uh, it's uh, Qualcomm and Alexa are working together uh, to bring some really cool um, voice activated uh, interactivity between not just the drivers of the vehicles, but also the people inside the vehicle. And one thing that Qualcomm's been really good at um, that a lot of people also don't know is audio. So smart microphones, smart speakers. And so one of the really cool things about this, in my opinion, and I think where Qualcomm brings um, a, a really good piece of the puzzle that was missing in bringing uh, you know, voice activated assistance to the cars is noise cancellation, intelligent noise analysis and voice analysis. So that when you have your windows rolled down, when you have kids screaming in the back seat, when you have music on speakers, you can still have uh, an intelligent uh, voice language and noise analysis that allows the in-vehicle uh, voice assistant to hear the right words, not to yeah. mishear them, uh, and so you have a, a kind of UX uh, value add with Qualcomm's assistance here that Alexa on its own wouldn't be able to uh, to deliver as well. So um, that's something that jumped out at me because it's, it's and then one more thing before we move on to the next topic uh, <laughs> is there's, there's always one more thing. But I'm actually kind of excited about this because, again, there were a lot of announcements and they were all pretty cool. Um, 
one of the things that really jumped out at me also um, was uh, something that that Qualcomm probably should talk about more, <laughs> and it's car to cloud services. And yeah. car to cloud services, because obviously Qualcomm is is very strong in in wireless, is I think a, a big piece of the puzzle when it comes to technology innovation and vehicles. So. Um, it's, it's kind of normal for us to think about updating our phones. Well, if, if we're very lucky once a year, but more on average, every two to three years, we update our phones because right. we want to keep up with the latest technologies. Right. We buy so, new phones, you mean? Yes, we buy new phones. Yes. <laughs> we don't necessarily buy new cars every year or every two to three years. Yeah. Um, a lot of people lease their cars and that's great, but a lot of people buy their cars and want to keep them for seven, 10, 15 years. And so what do you do with a car that you want to keep for 10, 15 years if the technology in it might become obsolete or at least might need an update or an upgrade in the next three to five years. Um, and so there, you know, I, even my car, uh, everything works great. I'm very happy with the GPS and the, the connectivity, but it's a few years behind. And I'd love to right. upgrade the technology inside the car without necessarily having to buy a new car. And so what Qualcomm has done with all these systems is created a, a wireless way, like an over the air way right. of uh, updating your existing systems, whether they're security updates, like with your computer and your phone, right. OS updates, new functionality, right. sort of stuff for Alexa, for instance, new ADAS technologies. Um, and so you're not, you don't have to plug it into anything. <laughs> you don't have to necessarily go to a dealership and pay for someone to do this while you wait. Uh, this is something that can be done over networks. And yeah, so, it's just like um, updating the OS on your phone. Yeah. You know. So I think it's a really good selling point yeah. for Qualcomm to go to uh, automakers and say, look, we can, we can actually deliver this uh, value add for customers because it's not so much the automaker putting technology in the vehicle. It's what happens once the buyer, the user, the owner of the car is out there. And, and it, I know that if I go into a car dealership today and look for a car, I'm looking, that's one of the questions I'm going to ask is what do I do about this technology two right. years down the road, right? And, and so right. Qualcomm is providing a solution, which I think will be very attractive to a lot of own makers. So, uh, you know, speaking of, of what do I do about a little personal anecdote here, um, I drive a Mercedes SUV. And I bought it at the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just over a year old, but I bought it in at the end of December. And like many business owners are nodding. Yeah, I've done that before. Um, I bought it at the end of December. And um, one of the things, you know, totally like the dashboard on this car is probably one of the main reasons I bought it because it was just so incredibly gorgeous and big and awesome. And, and um, when I bought it, I talked a little bit with the tech people at the dealership and they said, you know, what, what we'd love for you to do is to drive it for, you know, a few weeks, 30 days, whatever, you know, just kind of get comfortable with it. And then we have you come in and we walk you through a lot of the specifics of technology, because if they do this huge brain dump, like, you know, right when I buy the car, you know, you forget everything. And so it's just kind of like learning the nuances and everything. So I'm like, okay, cool. And so my daughter's getting married in February in Chicago our team is scheduled to head to Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. And, you know, our, my life is all planned out. And getting back to the dealership to go through the tech setup of my car is not very high on my list. And then a global pandemic happens. And, you know, the whole world stops. And the last thing I care about is going to the dealership to learn about how to use my car. And so I have, um, I, I mean, my car will park itself. My car has voice assistant technology where I can say, hey, Mercedes, and, and you know, tell it what I want it to do. Um, I have used none of that technology because I don't know how to use it and I don't want to read the manual. And I do use, I mean, I use some of the easy stuff, but it's just funny that um, sometimes you have technology in your car. <laughs> that It's kind of like, I, I know that I'm not alone in that there are many like fast keys or different cool things I could use on my computer or on my phone that I just don't make, I haven't made time to learn. And so, you know, I'm really behind the curve, but um, someday soon, 
I am going to have an appointment and understand how to use all of the functionality in my car. But in all seriousness, once you have a vehicle, and I went from a um, I went from a bigger Lexus SUV that also had a bunch of technology in it. This car has quite a bit more technology in it. But once you drive a vehicle that has that's a connected vehicle that has safety features, that it has so many things built into it. It's really hard. Like in this particular car, um, it will stop me if I am backing up and am going to back into something. I mean, it will literally stop the car. Or if I am driving and it feels like I'm getting too close to the car in front of me, like coming up to a stoplight, you can feel the system shutting you down. And it's really interesting. You know, I haven't had a situation where where the car has actually prevented me from having an accident. I haven't been that close to something. But it is interesting. Once you're driving a car and and you get used to being surrounded by smart technology, um, and then you think about, you know, the decades that I drove cars (laughs) that had, you know, nothing but power windows, maybe. Um, So you just think like, it, it would be very difficult to experience a truly connected car and then go back to driving something that didn't really have any of those safety features or options or anything like that. And, and, but I also think that that's why we're seeing them across the board in vehicle, you know, it's not only just luxury vehicles, we're seeing these in GM vehicles in all different kinds of vehicles. And I think that's truly um, very quickly becoming our norm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, so speaking of that, speaking of that, um, we're going to talk about that, yeah. <laughs> we're going to talk about the chips that make all this happen, and the fact that um, there's a problem. There is, and by the way, don't don't pay any attention to the fact that half the time I'm talking, I look like I have horns and ears <laughs> because I really need to change my angle. Um, yeah, so there is a, a unfortunately a, a very severe chip so- shortage. Um, right now and we're not talking about doritos uh you're not goodness. yeah that would be terrible uh this is this is almost as bad so essentially what's happened is starting at the end of last year um there's been a global shortage of auto chips specifically um and and one of the reasons uh was obviously i mean this was all caused by covid so essentially covid came the pandemic began uh at the beginning of last year and forced automakers to temporarily shut their factories down, uh, including their showrooms. It wasn't just the manufacturing, it was also the sales. Um, Car sales dropped, I think, overall last year, something like 15% um, over the previous year. Um, And then on top of that, you had like uncertainty about jobs, right? As the economy was kind of shutting down and and everybody was batting the hatches, uh, the economy kind of froze, so people were reluctant to necessarily make major purchases like vehicles. And then also, since people were on lockdown uh, with with nowhere to go, uh, it isn't like they needed to buy a new car. Uh, so that, that really slowed things down. And so what happened is semiconductor manufacturers who were starting to make uh, a lot of chips out for vehicles for reasons that we just explained – started to reassign production capacity to uh, to other companies or clients making other devices. So smartphones, laptops, a lot of gaming devices were sold last year, extra TVs. Um, and chip makers have been slammed making semiconductors for all of those uh, types of devices and sort of shifted from automotive, which had much lower demand, to these electronics that had higher demand. Um, however, in the meantime, or at least since then, uh, interest rates have been so low and the fear as we start to have normal lives again and start looking forward to having normal lives, the fear of going back to public transportation, of crowding into you know, subways and buses and trains, um, people started buying cars again, uh, mainly SUVs, sedans and pickups. And um, so the, the return to normal, in other words, the, the demand for vehicles bounced back a lot sooner and a lot faster than everyone anticipated. And the big problem now is that there's, there's a little bit of friction. Uh, the lead times for suppliers to respond to uh, automakers who are adjusting their demand and their orders for these chips is about six to nine months. 
So that's that's kind of like the delay that you have to work with. So anywhere from half a year to three quarters of a year for from the time that uh, automakers start reacting to demand until they start getting in the shipments of chips. And so we're kind of in that crunch right now where there's a lot of demand for vehicles and automakers need to make vehicles, but they don't have the chips yeah. or they, they, they are looking at their supply chain and they may have many of the chips now, but they, they are, they're going to run out because they're just going to go through their stock if they move too fast. Well, and part so of this too, though, is, you know, part of the shortage is driven by a, a pandemic related boom in, you know, gaming consoles and laptops and televisions and this the commu- uh, consumer devices that have been eating up the chip supply. And, and I think that from a manufacturing standpoint, the percentage of manufacturing devoted to automotive related needed chips and compared to consumer goods chips is very, very small, like something like 10% or something like yeah, that. It's like 12%. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah, the, the buying power of these other companies is much greater than, than automotive. So, so the chip makers are kind of like in a, in, in, in a weird spot right now. On the one hand, you know, they have a finite amount of production that they can, that they can deal with right now. And, and the thing about the Chinese uh, is they can, they can build production and, uh, pretty quickly, much more quickly, I think, than, um, than we can in the West. So there's an opportunity for them to react to this and, and to do this. But in the meantime... Uh, they kind of have to choose, right? Do we make our customers happy, our big customers, the Apples and Samsungs of the world? Um, or do we kind of still sort of try to focus on this automotive need and start building that market and, and build that footprint in uh, automaker uh, or uh, automotive uh, rather specific chip making? And, and do we use this to kind of, you know, get as much of that market share as possible? Um, it is important to note, I think, or at least interesting, that uh, TSMC, not a Chinese company. Well, let's d- depending on on what side of the aisle you you stand <laughs> on this particular con- Taiwan based. <laughs> to, yes, Taiwan yeah. based. Uh, so Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, uh, TSMC. I th- if I'm not mistaken, accounted for over half. So I think it was like 56 or 50, 57 percent of all global chip manufacturing revenue in the last quarter uh, of 2020. So that's like the most recent information we have. So that's that's one company. Uh, and there's a lot of outsourcing that goes on and, and, and different things. So it's it's a little bit more nuanced than that. But what we have essentially is, is a, a disproportionate amount of reliance in the market on this one company to be a supplier to all of these different industries and verticals. And so that puts a lot of power on one hand in, in TSMC's hands, but also it limits our ability to uh, to be agile sometimes when it comes to adjusting to things like this. And it's something that we saw, I think, for the first time uh, during the meltdown, uh, well, during the, uh, the, the the earthquake that created the tsunami that then crippled a lot of industry production in Japan uh, a decade ago, uh, the reliance of some of the companies there on, on one or two manufacturers showed how just that one earthquake, that one unexpected event could really slow down automotive production uh, for the same reasons. And we have a, a kind of a similar thing with the pandemic and our reliance on um, on that particular chip maker today that's that's making things a little bit more um, precarious or at least that's making it slower for uh, for the automotive industry to, to bounce back yeah it's interesting and you know not every car maker has been impacted i think you know I, i'm seeing toyota and hyundai and um uh, VW's Audi, um, you know, I think that they have had less problems than some other brands. Um, and it, you know, it really is, it really is a big problem. I know, uh, Fiat Chrysler and, uh, has struggled. And so it really is, it's a, it's an ongoing battle. And I think the industry as a whole is, um, you know, pretty panicked. So it will be interesting to see, um, It will be interesting to see sort of how the supply chain sort of writes itself in the coming months, for sure. Yeah, the car makers are having to make some some tough choices and kind of prioritize um, which vehicles and which plants, uh, which markets that they they want to kind of 
protect and which ones are kind of like secondary. So it's kind of interesting to see which plants are uh, either planning shutdowns or uh, are already shut down. I saw that Ford was one of the companies that had uh, stopped or at least slowed production in a couple of plants already for certain types of vehicles that probably don't sell as well as others. Right. Um, but I think to, to kind of give scope to this, um, we're looking at potentially the, the a missed target uh, production for the first quarter of 100,000 vehicles uh, overall, which is about 4% of global quarterly output. Uh, and also the shortage from a financial standpoint, you could be looking at $14 billion in lost revenue for the automotive industry just in the first quarter and maybe 60 billion uh, yeah. overall in 2021. So it's it's kind of massive and it's it's not a permanent problem. They're gonna bounce back, but it's probably gonna take uh, most of the year to get back to normal and probably auto production won't reach 2019 levels again yeah. until sometime uh, in 2023. So it may take an additional yeah. year for us to get back to completely normal. Yeah, I'm seeing in a Financial Times piece that uh, that kind of inspired this conversation is that you know they're saying that the production of more than 280,000 vehicles has already been put on ice according to Auto Forecast Solutions and IHS Market forecasts that as many as 500,000 vehicles could ultimately be affected. You know, worldwide, um, that's a big number. But worldwide, you know, we're not just talking about just the United States or whatever. So it, it is an impact that will be felt across the world. But, you know, as we mentioned, some automakers more than others. And we're also seeing automakers turning to developing their own relationships with chip makers, um, which I think is interesting as well. And we, you know, what we've learned, a pandemic has taught us a lot about supply chain. Yeah. And that sometimes business as usual can be, you know, operating on a business as usual, this is the way we've always done it, mindset can be dangerous. And so sometimes having those relationships of your own and, yeah. um, you know, or developing your own, you know, we know that China's working on that. Um, so this will really be interesting to watch for sure. Yeah. And since sure. on the, uh, the, the kind of in-house Qualcomm whisper. We can circle back and, and for me, I, I think, I mean, Qualcomm is, is limited in the same way that all chip makers are because a lot of production is, you know, all over the world. And, and so it's not a typically just primarily American issue. But as we were kind of talking about how companies with the most market power are going to have perhaps a little bit more leverage with the relationships that they have and some of the ways that uh, chip makers are prioritizing um, production for different uh, types of devices and verticals, I think that Qualcomm, again, has an opportunity here. Not that they would want this. Nobody wants this, and it's going to be a crunch for everyone. But Qualcomm might be really well positioned um, because they have their hands in so many different verticals, and they're pushing so hard for automotive uh, to have some impact on this. Uh, and, and in other words, what I'm saying is that automakers who have invested already in using Qualcomm chipsets and technologies in their vehicles might have an advantage in terms of getting their hands on on uh, chips uh, compared to some of the ones that, that may be working with smaller companies um, with a little bit less market power. So um, we'll see if I'm right about that, but um, I'm, I haven't been wrong yet, I don't think. <laughs> about anything ever. I, I, have a, I have a track record of very few mistakes in the last 37 minutes. <laughs> Well, all right. I think that's going to wrap up our show, Olivier. As always, it's a pleasure hanging out with you. And uh, to our audience, thanks for hanging out with us today. And um, we will definitely be watching. We will be watching what's happening with devices. We'll be watching what's happening in the auto industry. We'll be watching what Qualcomm's doing. We'll be watching what NVIDIA is doing. We'll be watching what's going on with chips. And uh, we'll be talking more about this for sure. And with that, have a great rest of the day.